Thank you, Chair. Well, this, this talk is going to have nothing to do with development economics, or very little to do, because uh, my ambition is simply to set the political framework. If we're talking about aid policy post-2015, it's quite useful to remind ourselves about what created aid policy in the period uh, before 2015. So I think we can really divide that into, into two. Uh, and um, if we look at the post-war settlement and the period really right up to 1990, uh, we're talking about two major factors uh, in the background which drove aid policy. Uh, one of those, of course, is the Cold War. Uh, and the second one is the decolonization uh, process. So the Cold War dynamic meant that the donors uh, the US, uh, the Europeans, uh, the Russians, the Chinese essentially uh, worked with their ideological uh, partners. Uh, they supported their development programs on the basis of their uh, ideology. Uh, so uh, aid policy was essentially an extension of uh, political uh, policy. That doesn't mean at all to say that all aid projects were bad. Uh, but uh, uh, to the contrary, many of them were extremely good. But uh, the basis for entering into an aid relationship was a political one. And also there were commercial objectives uh, uh, as well. I remember well the uh, 1980 uh, paper when uh, Mrs. Thatcher came into uh, government in the UK, setting out very clearly that uh, political, trade, commercial and defence objectives were to stand up there alongside uh, aid objectives in determining uh, aid policy. And then the second factor, of course, is the decolonization process for, for, for countries like uh, the UK, uh, France, Spain, Portugal, who had uh, significant uh, colonies uh, left, uh, particularly in Africa, but also in parts of, of Asia, continuing their support through uh, maintaining the infrastructure which they had largely been responsible for delivering. So aid policy was about supporting uh, roads, uh, about supporting uh, hospitals, uh, schools, uh, developing the capacity through technical assistance uh, of those countries to be able to continue uh, with that um, themselves. This was um, in many ways a, a, a good thing to do as, as those countries gradually took on uh, those responsibilities but was disrupted by uh, the first factor which I mentioned before, which is uh, the Cold War. Uh, and the 70s and 80s, I, I know people describe as the lost decades of development. That was, that was largely true because what mattered above all was the nature of the political relationship. There is a, there is a story, I don't know whether it's true or not, of um, the US Secretary of State taking in an African leader, let's call it Mobutu, I don't know who it was, to see the president. And um, they had a half hour conversation. And um, after they'd had that conversation, uh, the American president asked his secretary of state to come in and see him. And he said, um, and forgive my American accent, uh, gee, Mr. Secretary of State, that guy was a real bastard. And uh, the Secretary of State said, uh, oh, yes, sir, but he's our bastard. And I think that kind of sets the, sets the tone for, 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 for what aid policy was about. It was about supporting your friends, and it was about confounding your enemies. Issues like human rights, how much aid reached the poorest people, really didn't feature very large uh, uh, in that uh, set of equations. Everything changed with the fall of the Berlin Wall uh, at the end of 1989, and um, driven by the model of uh, Eastern and Central European countries uh, wanting to become parts of the European Union, different factors began to come into play. So those countries who wanted to drive their own development, they wanted better democracy, they wanted better governments, they wanted to take, to take human rights into consideration, became factors for uh, determining whether or not they were able to enter into the European Union. And so in the, that period in the early 1990s, people began to ask the question, well, if, if we're having these considerations taken into account in our programs towards these countries in Eastern and Central Europe, shouldn't we be thinking the same way in our aid relationships? Shouldn't we be taking issues like rights into account, democratization, uh, better governance, uh, uh, all those sort of things, more into account in our uh, 
uh, aid relationships. And I remember very well uh, running um, uh, DFID programs in, in East Africa in the, in, in the 1990s um, when I uh, went to our regional office uh, in 1993 I think I had three engineers and three natural resource agricultural uh, advisors. Um, and by the time I left four years later in 1997, I had one of each. Um, but I also had these strange new people called governance advisors and social development advisors. Um, I think the only thing that remained constant through this period was the large number of economists. Um, so, um, people began to think about um, who, is, who's, who, who is aid really targeting? What should aid policy be really about? Who are the people we're trying to reach here? Is it, is it heads of government? Is it uh, ruling elites? Uh, is it governments? Uh, is it the people? And gradually those ideas began to coalesce uh, into the international development targets, uh, which in turn uh, transmuted into the Millennium Development goals. Um, this audience needs no uh, reminding of what those are, the overall arching goal of um, halving the proportion of people living in absolute poverty by 2015, and a number of subsidiary goals essentially around uh, primary education and basic health. So here we are now 15 years uh, later. Uh, the period of the Millennium Development Goals about to expire at the end of the year. Um, far more successful in making progress towards those goals, I think, than almost anybody had imagined um, 15 years ago. Uh, why has that happened? Largely because of very strong uh, economic growth in certain parts of the world, uh, above all, of course, in China, but other countries in Eastern Asia too, in, in South Asia, and actually in a lot of African countries uh, as well. So, th so that economic growth has, has, driven, um, has driven progress towards uh, the MDGs. Two or three years ago, people started to think about what should come after the Millennium Development Goals. Um, and um, uh, there's been a really interesting process, I think, a very consultative process over the last two or three years of, of, of thinking about what should come uh, next. Um, and those thoughts and ideas and consultations, widespread both within governments but also within civil society, have led to this new set of sustainable development goals which will be formally signed off uh, in New York uh, next week where many people in this room will be. Now, uh, many of us will have problems reminding ourselves of what those 17 goals are let alone the 169 targets that come underneath them. But the, the document, Transforming Our World, very helpfully sets out five Ps, which is the way that uh, I find it quite easy to remember what these sustainable development goals uh, are all about. So the first P is prosperity, economic growth. The second one is planet. You mustn't have this growth uh, whilst um, destroying the environment on which we all depend. Um, uh, in the process. The third is people. Uh, we heard this morning, you know, this theme, this idea of, of leave no one behind, because if you halve the proportion of world uh, uh, of people living in absolute poverty, you still have half uh, of those people living in absolute poverty. If you reduce the number of mothers dying in childbirth, you still have too many mothers dying in, in childbirth. So it's about those and about thinking about who are the people who are being left behind? Who are the people who have been left out? It's possible to take a very uh, economic approach to that, but it's also possible to think maybe disabled people are, are the people who are being left uh, behind of this. Maybe it's, it's ethnic minorities. Uh, maybe it's the peop people because of their sexuality. These are things that kind of go uh, beyond economics and um, are perhaps more uh, intuitive. The fourth P, and it's very important, is peace, because I think we all recognize that unless there is reasonable uh, uh, security and peace and, and reasonable governance in a country, you're simply not going to make the progress that you, that you need. And then the fifth P, of, of course, is, uh, is, is partnerships. What does all this tell us then about the exam question that we've, be, we've been asked, which is aid policy uh, post-2015? And I think we have to remember that the world is a very different looking place in, in 2015 from, from 2000. 
2000, the paradigm was still very much about uh, there is a group of developed countries and there's a, there is a group of developing countries. There is North and South, uh, and it is the responsibility of the North to support the countries of the South in their development uh, programs and essentially explain to them how they should, how they should uh, do it. Although that notion of, of country ownership was, was becoming increasingly strong in the, in the 1990s. Um, so, um, I, I think the, the important thing about this is that um, uh, those changes need to be reflected in that whole paradigm of A policy in 2015. Um, perhaps, particularly, the, uh, the changing world after the, um, the financial crash of, of 2008 what we all describe as the, as the global financial crash, which I think, if I'm right, the Chinese describe as the North Atlantic uh, crisis. Um, so uh, the power structures uh, in the world now look very different. The G8 simply doesn't matter as much as it once did. The G20 is much more important uh, than it was. Uh, many developing economies, uh, the BRICS, of course, China perhaps uh, above all, but, but India as well, uh, Brazil, are developing different sorts of relationship with what we have traditionally thought of as the uh, developing uh, countries. How does that play into the development of, of, of aid policy? How, how are those countries going to, to feature? What are the experiences that developing countries can, can learn? Is aid in future all going to be about uh, grant uh, support? Or are there different mechanisms that we can look at to stimulate South-South uh, cooperation? We've always been very against the notion of, of aid tying, for example, for very good reasons, because that was traditionally used to support uh, northern companies, northern goods, and essentially to subsidize uh, some of their goods and products. But if China ties at aid, is that really such a bad thing? Because it may help to increase uh, uh, the resources which they're prepared to make available to other countries. Uh, but the difference between the, the price of tied aid and untied aid is much lower than it would be otherwise. So those are some of the questions that I think we need to be looking at as we move into this post-2015 agenda. How are we going to achieve this overarching uh, objective of um, reaching zero absolute poverty by 2030, whatever that means? And we've had some interesting uh, discussions uh, about that this morning. Um, I know that some of the economists who I've been talking to are, are nervous about the SDGs because they're not sure which of them are going to be measurable and whether we can really judge progress against uh, all of them. There is, as you know, a process of um, uh, defining some indicators, which is not yet complete, which will be complete by March 2016. Some of those will be measurable. Some of them won't be measurable. Some, some of these targets, you simply will have to take a judgment about progress. But this is why it's equally important to look at the politics as the economics. Uh, at the end of this month, all the countries in the world will sign up to these new sustainable development goals. These are not just goals for the South. These are universal goals. These are goals which are as binding on countries like the UK as they are on the countries of Africa. This is a compact between governments and their peoples. And the fact that governments have signed up to this compact means that the peoples of those countries, whether in the UK or, or countries in Africa, have something for which they can hold their governments to account. And I think that is a fantastically important uh, development. Uh, I think I've perhaps left one or two hooks for the, the two Richards to hang their comments on about where this all goes in future, but I hope that provides um, a, a framework within which they can make some of their remarks. Thank you. <laughs>